So this talk here today, it's about eBPF um, and how to run eBPF programs in Kubernetes without using the privileged flag. Um, so about me or about us, uh, I work at the Grafana Labs. I am a compiler nerd. I spend most of my career working on managed runtimes, compilers, and garbage collection. Uh, sort of segued into eBPF. Um, it's all low-level programming, so it worked out. Um, and uh, but also a co-author of this presentation here is David Ashford from Google, uh, who actually, as an external contributor, contributed most of the patches around reducing privileges for our product, Grafana Bela at Grafana. Um, so he couldn't be in person, but virtually, I guess. So this talk here, I'm going to give a bit of a brief, brief introduction into eBPF. Um, maybe familiar to some of you, but for completeness sake, I'll go over it a little bit. And then go into what it takes to run eBPF in Kubernetes, uh, what kind of permissions we need or Linux capabilities. And finally, maybe talk about how to reduce some of those permissions and what are the challenges around that. So eBPF, I'm going to skip the history about it. Uh, there's a few talks over here already about eBPF. But it's essentially a virtual machine, at least in my mind, inside the kernel, which lets you extend kernel, kernel's functionality without writing kernel modules. It's like programming for the kernel without programming for the kernel, if you will. And you can hook into any part of the Linux kernel, but maybe even user space libraries, add functionality to them to some extent. Um, and the good thing about it compared to kernel modules, which is what we used in the past, is that it's extremely fast and it's safe. There's a verifier that checks any code loaded into this virtual machine for correctness, for memory accesses, for not running loops that will hold out the kernel and make it unstable. Uh, and it also comes up with nice properties. If you ever unloaded a program, it sort of cleans itself up. And it's pretty reliable at doing that. So no stale memory leaks and destabilizing your machine by adding or removing it. So same goes for Kubernetes. Adding eBPF programs in Kubernetes should at least not disrupt your Kubernetes cluster in any way. So it's really nice for that. Now, what does it look like typically? Let's say I wanted to write a program that will figure out if any container in my Kubernetes cluster is opening on a connection and wanted to track that. So for example, TCP connection going outside, what is the port, what is the IP? Maybe I was writing a security solution. Maybe I just wanted to monitor how often this happens. So typically what I need to write is this monitor program that can be written in any programming language and then write a BPF probe that will attach to this disconnect. So what actually happens is this monitor program maybe has this BPF probe compiled, maybe composite on the fly, loads it into the kernel. It, when it loaded, attaches to whatever it's meant to attach. And then it can read the arguments of that maybe SOC adder struct. And then potentially through this eBPF data, I can export that data and send it back to the monitoring program. That's the basics of eBPF, of the mechanics, what it takes to extend the Linux kernel with this. OK, so what do people do with this eBPF? Why would they write these programs? What is typically done today? And I searched long and in, on GitHub. Looked, I've looked for the past year and a half of various companies, what kind of programs they write. And it falls into a few categories, but typically is this one is network packet routing. Uh, Cilium CNI, perhaps one of the best known software for doing this. Um, and you can do load balancing, you can do hot code, stand, standby, replace, anything you typically do at the network level. You can rewrite packets, you can wrap protocols, you can do all sorts of things, you modify network packets. Then people use it for monitoring, maybe sometimes reactive or proactive monitoring. For example, our product, Grafana Bela, uses it to monitor level seven protocols or in level four protocols on TCP stack. There's people that use it for different kinds of observability. 
maybe system call observability for tracking performance from that perspective. They use it for profiling. There's a really nice way to write profilers to get interrupted on every, I don't know, uh, some number of counters. Uh, then you can walk, capture the stack. And so really good for profiling solutions. Um, and also people use it for security. Um, there's few uh, CNC projects that actually do track security with eBPF. So they will track system calls, they will track network connections. Um, you can export that data or you can react on it. And you can say, oh, I saw a program being launched that I'm not sure it should be launched somewhere in my cluster. It looks weird. It's not on the list of approved software. Or maybe I can nuke it, right? Then record that event. And finally, people do monitor user space libraries. Uh, we, for example, monitor libssl, so we can actually track level 7 protocol traffic for HTTPS or gRPC all over SSL. All right. Now, all these things I talked about, it would seem intuitively that you need some sort of permissions to be doing all these things, right? It, you would not expect that I can just have no permissions, but be able to monitor all my traffic or be able to modify TCP packets. This does sound like I need permissions for this. And initially, I think there were a lot of, uh, there's a lot of confusions in the EBF community right now that eBPF didn't need permissions so you could do all these bad things. Maybe in the initial version, people could run something in, in with actual normal users, which was quickly disabled. And we do need privileged to some level, some level of escalated or elevated permissions to run these programs for a good reason, right? But just how much we do. And this is where the typical, a lot of eBPF programs you'll find out there will just do this. And that, for a lot of people, they're just, it's a, it's a no-go. And uh, so that created a, uh, and I've talking to customers here and there about deploying the product. I found a lot of misconceptions about eBPF just needs all permissions. And without that, you can't run it. And therefore, it's a security hole. You shouldn't be doing it in your program, right? In your environment, in your Kubernetes uh, cluster. So with this permission, yes, I understand. If I was able to break into the container, potentially I have escalated my permissions to other containers. And it's pretty bad. So to talk about why people need that privileged container, we have to go back and say, understand why do they put that, typically? Uh, is there a way around it? What can we do about that? And the answer is we don't need privileged in most cases. Um, but permission-wise, the eBPF programs sort of fall into two separate categories, which make this a little bit complex to understand. There's programs, eBPF programs, that are typically simpler that only store memory on their own. So they have this eBPF maps, maybe they share with the monitoring program, but it's just for that program. And those are usually the simpler solutions. But oftentimes, you need to persist that memory somehow in eBPF. Let's say maybe you want to make your program resilient in case your container restarts that it can pick up from where it left off. Maybe you're using some sort of memory that is difficult to compute or it, or it takes time. Maybe scanning the Kubernetes cluster, uh, namespaces and things like that, So which you don't want to repeat on restart. Or if you want to structure your program such as it has multiple of these probes, and then you load them on demand based on what you currently see, but maybe a state changes in a Kubernetes cluster, and then you need to load another kind of program. Then you need to share memory between these programs. The only way to do it is as memory map files pinned on disk. And this is where a big, one big permission problem happens, which is the file system, BPF file system, which is the only place where BPF programs are allowed to actually store memory and share it among different programs or different runs of the same program. So this BPF file system is notoriously difficult to work around permission-wise. So this is most times privilege true, actually, is because of this BPF file system. Now, there's a way around it in Kubernetes. And you can use capability sysadmin 
And then you also have to disable Kubernetes app armor for that container that is actually accessing BV file system, and then you get around fairly true. But then my question is, is this any better? And I don't think it is. I've just disabled app armor for this container, and I've given this container sysadmin privileges, which sort of gives me back to where a privilege true is. All right, so we haven't done much, but this is the reason why we can use regular system capabilities um, because this app armor actually does prevent mount and does prevent accessing sysfs, which in that case prevents us from using BPFL system. Now, fortunately for us, this is something credit to a Cilium project. Um, the way to work around this to enable BPF programs to run with lower permissions is to create an init container that is permissioned with privilege, enough to set up what's required for the main container. So then from then on, after this init container sets up, what's needed for the, your actual BPF program then you can actually run your BPF program with much lower permissions, only with what you need. So your persistent state at Kubernetes, your final state in Kubernetes, is actually a lot better than privileged true. So the trick there is that this init container will create the mount, will create the required permissions, and then is able to inject that into the actual container that you're going to be running. Right? This is really short-lived and only for this purpose. Now, with that out of the way, we can start talking about how do we now actually piecemeal the permissions for the BPF uh, programs, depending on what we have, to get them to run with much lower permissions. Now, this also is dependent on the Linux kernel. And the trick here is sort of in the past, before 5.8 kernel, most permissions were bundled under sysadmin, unfortunately. So capability sysadmin gave you even something really low, like network access, or, but also gave you everything else. However, the community moved on from this. So with these container environments that I've listed here, if you have any version greater than that, and you have a kernel version bigger than 5.8, the only things you need for running a BPF program is capability BPF, and that's what's the minimum. That's what the documentation says, but I've also found that perfmon is almost always required. Anything you're going to read as a performance event, looking at any events coming through assistance, you need perfmon. But much better than sysadmin. Now, if you're an older kernel, like cap sysadmin, must. Um, typically, BPF programs tend to store memory. For that reason, they need to increase the amount of locked memory available in the system. So before 5.11, cap sys resource was required so that BPF programs can actually load into this lock memory. So increasing the lock memory limit on the system, which could be done with different means, but done automatically by the library. If it's not sufficient, uh, you need a sys resource. On newer kernels, that's not required. So now we come to the use cases of BPF and what they actually need really to run. Now, I talked about network monitoring, network um, changing packets, and so on. So let's start with the simplest way. If we're just going to write K probes or use trace points to monitor TCP traffic, we don't need anything else. So the bottom part. And then it comes like, if we want to write a socket filter that we can monitor any traffic, not just TCP, like UDP, different protocols that maybe we don't know of, uh, then you need capability network raw to be able to see those events. If you're going to get to use Linux traffic control to be able to attach to the traffic control, create something called QDisk, or modify packets as if what Cilium does, then you need net admin, which sort of makes sense, right? If I'm just going to read, I need raw access to the network. If I'm going to modify it and potentially write memory to the, into the network packets, then I need network administrator. Okay, but lot, still a lot better than sysadmin. So now we come to the second biggest problem. Um, again, user libraries. So if we want to monitor user libraries in the containerized environment, there's few other considerations. And from 
Kubernetes standpoint and any BPF program, the main challenge with user space libraries is that they're deployed in a specific container, right? So, and your daemon set maybe, or even a sidecar may not actually have the same binaries. Right, let's say I want to instrument a libssl attached to a Python program running inside some container on my Kubernetes cluster. And I want to monitor what that Python program is maybe doing. What kind of network traffic it's sending, it's receiving, and so on, so I can compute requests per second. Now, this Python program in the container environment is deployed with some Python version, but how do I actually get to that executable to maybe attach myself to that particular version of libssl? Maybe my container has libssl, but it may not be the same version. It's not the same binary. They're not actually running that thing. So I need to be able to find that program. I also need to be able to open up that L file and attach into it. So for that reason, the way we do it is by looking at proc, by process ID, and then looking at the executable. Like my daemon set will have access if I've given it host PID access to any process ID on the system. So then for that, this is how I find the executable. This is how, through the map files, I find the actual shared library that maybe is attached to that program. For that purpose, we need CAPSYS ptrace. So this ptrace gives us ability to dig in through these process uh, mapped executables and libraries. And finally, these two specific permissions, checkpoint restore and DAG read search, um, are needed to open up the L file. Now don't ask me how this is found, like this is trial and error, and also reading kernel source. This is one of the challenges with this sort of thing, which is why everybody sort of resorts to, let's just give it everything, is because it's so difficult to find what you actually need. It requires tracing the kernel, maybe reading the kernel source, requires, if you don't have that capability or you don't want to do that, maybe trial and error, keep running your, your program until it actually works with various of these permissions. There's not that many, but yeah. Um, so, and finally, bef there's plenty of cases today, even today, where sysadmin is a must or privileged container. Well, obviously, our kernels before five, um, it's, needed, it's needed, but typically after five, eight, we can split it off. So, for example, you may think you need a system admin capability to kill a program that you don't want to launch because it's malicious. Maybe you've detected it through various security rules that it's not actually a program you want to run. Then you need keep you get a kill permission. You don't need sysadmin. But before 5.8, unfortunately, you need sysadmin. Now, another place where you need sysadmin for sure is writing user space memory. This is sort of frowned upon by the kernel community. That helper, if, I'm pretty sure they can take it away right now. They can, they will. But it's sort of been in the, in the kernel for a while and in the BPF tool set that you can change user space memory. We use it to propagate context for Go applications. It's also used by the Go auto instrumentation program from CNC, uh, tooling from CNCF, open telemetry. But if, it's, if you're not doing that, sysadmin is almost not needed. And finally, like some Debian distros, depending on what you're running on, uh, will have this kernel perf event paranoid greater than three or equal to three. I, the documentation says it should be two at max for most distributions, but some distributions have their own special codes for that flag. And uh, if it's set greater than three, then it will require sysadmin for most eBPF programs, unfortunately. Now, you can reward, you can set it back to two, which is the recommended setting, or sysadmin. There's no way around it. Okay, so key takeaways. My takeaway uh, that I want to present is that many eBPF programs in many situations do not need privilege or sysadmin. That's just difficulty to understand what privileges you need is driving people to just sort of take the sledgehammer and say, I need sysadmin. Um, using privilege init containers 
allows us to remove some of these elevated permissions from the final container that's running. And that typically stands for programs that need to mount BPF file system uh, for the purpose of either restoring data after restarts or by sharing amongst different BPF programs. And on modern kernels, I'd like to say it's almost never needed or it's needed for maybe subset of functionality and if the programs are written well, they can gracefully degrade to not needing system that. That's it. That's it. Thank you so much for coming. Um, if you want to see our project, you want to contribute, you want to play with it, this is how to connect with myself, my team. Um, that's it. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Do you think it would be possible to run runtime detection tools without privileged containers? I think so. I think it depends. The only question is to ask is like, why is the privilege needed? Um, it typically boils down to some Linux system capability that they require. Um, the unfortunate thing is not actually clear. There's no guide in the Linux kernel to say, okay, so you're making this call, system call, this is what you need to run it. There's no such thing. It's mostly trial and error. And for our case, I always thought that we needed system privileged containers until somebody really pushed like David and said, well, why do you really need it? Let's dig into that because I'd like to not have it privileged on. And this journey took us through trying out many things, running system kernel traces to see where it actually, what function did block and reading the kernel and saying, okay, well, this needs this capability. Let's put that in. Does it go through? And then you st get stopped on something else, and it's okay, which capability? And eventually you end up with a list of capabilities. Um, now, unfortunately, that's only after 5.8. Before 5.8, people just use this. And a lot of those learnings about putting sysadmin and putting privilege are, oh, I need elevated permissions, and at 5.8, before 5.8, I couldn't do anything. So it's an older learning rather than what's happened after 5 wave when they were broken down into very fine grain capabilities that you can actually pick and choose what you need. So when you're relying on the agent and the API agent on customer workloads, yeah. many of the times you don't know ahead of time what kernel you actually are running. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what we do is we, to some extent, is we ask the client ahead of time what version of kernel we're running, and then we give them a recommended solution. The answer to that is there's tooling that can be written to find out. Um, obviously, finding out the container version or the, um, the version of the kernel is possible through an init container, and you can just say, okay, sorry for this, and you can spew out an actual configuration file. So technically, if we were really sophisticated, this part over here uh, that I showed where this thing, right, could potentially write the config, the security config for the actual final container, knowing that what's the, the version is dealing with, right? So you could handle it in the same file with the permissions? Yeah, because if you look what this is doing, it's running bash here to set up a bunch of mount volumes, and then it says this, bilateral, bidirectional communication to allow that to be mounted in the final container. Uh, we have the full example in our repo if you want to take a look. But essentially, if I could do that for this particular BFS, I could actually modify the config and have it mounted into the final program. So we tell it what permissions it needs. Yeah, it's just a more sophistication, I guess, on, on the part of the program. Um, I believe Cilium has ways to detect that it's not given enough permissions to do what it needs to do, so they will actually give you nice messages. Our product is not as good uh, on that respect. So it will tell you, oh, you're missing this permission, you need to go and add it. Um, there's another product out there, open source, uh, Inspector Gadget. They've got into great depth because Inspector Gadgets, you can enable different gadgets. 
and it's meant for Kubernetes monitoring, but it's meant as a platform where you can kind of add your own modules and maybe contribute in the future with different gadgets. So Inspector Gadget, you can enable, disable various of these gadgets, network monitoring, process monitoring, this and that. And they have a really nice documentation. OK, for this, you need that. For this, you need that. For this, you need that. Because they've gone through the lens of dealing with uh, same, same sort of trouble that we had to go through. But in all cases, it's possible. It's just so tempting to use privilege true and be done with this and move on.